I want to continue with the same points I was just making, two points, the one about the uh, relations with others, and the other about uh, structure of action, a uh, uh, pre-reflective bodily response to exigency through the instrumentalities of, of the situation as well. Um, uh, so, but I want to bring those two together. And I want to do this quickly and then get on to uh, some of the moves Fanon makes in uh, the lived experience of the black man. <clears throat> um, so uh, imagine you go to a coffee shop, you leave your house, you walk down the street, you walk into a coffee shop, you go through the door, you walk up to the counter, uh, maybe you have to wait your turn, maybe the other people in line, uh, you get to, to speak to the server and you say, I'd like uh, an Americano. Uh, eventually you get it, give some money and so on. Okay, let's stop there. We could say, we could add a lot of details, but let's look at those. Um, uh, those actions of walking out on the street, uh, opening the door and so on, those are no different from the actions of putting down the book on the table when I had to get up to get the kettle, or no different from the action of getting the coffee cup out of the cupboard or getting the pot holder or whatever. Um, I walk down the street, uh, I open the door, etc. There's exactly the same uh, analysis could be given. But what I want you to notice is that uh, in all of our actions, that dialectic, or whatever the word should be, of self and other is at play, right? That, that issue, that sort of, I'm a subject, but I'm an object in the eyes of others. Is the other going to hand me back to myself, or, or etc.? That stuff is that those things that we were talking about from the first page of Black Skin White Masks aren't things that happen on some special occasions. They're they are the issues that are alive in all your actions all the time, and you can see that in walking down the street to the coffee shop. When I walk down the street to the coffee shop, where where I live in Toronto, anyway, these things are different in some places, of course. But here, I'm not worried when I walk down the street, um, and when I walk down the street, um, well, I'm not worried because. In, largely because I live in a society uh, in which it is recognized, which it is asserted that public space is open to all and individuals are free to move about and you can treat, you have the right to walk up and down the street. And I live in a society that is sufficiently um, protected in various other ways. And we may come back to this when we look at, look at the chapter on violence from the wretched of the earth. Um, uh, I don't worry about someone coming and attacking me. Of course, I know it could happen. These things do happen on you know rare, crazy occasions. But the street is a place that's a safe place for people to walk. Um, and when I, if I happen to drive, I wouldn't drive the wrong way down the street. And when I do walk, I walk on the sidewalk. I don't arbitrarily walk around in the middle of the road. So in that situation where I am operating according to the structures of instrumentality and exigency that we talked about before i'm doing that but uh my knowing uh implicitly knowing highly competent way of doing that is doing that in a way that is uh premised on and also uh reflective of the fact that i live in a situation where i am recognized in a certain way and i recognize others in a certain way when the, the when I walk down the street and another person comes the other way and I walk past that other person without noticing them, that's based on a kind of noticing of them in the sense that we, we can ignore each other because at a more basic level, we each are committed to the idea that other people are allowed to do their own private things. And I live my life confident in the expectation that other person is going to let me walk past without complaining. And that's what I'm going to do with them. So, so yes, at an explicit level, I don't notice them. I don't pay any attention to them. But at a deeper level, that very behavior is a kind of assertion about how I interpret other people and how I expect other people to interpret me. Unfortunately, that other person does it too. That last point means that my ability to walk down the street past that other person unmolested and oblivious to them is something that we can only do together. I can expect it, but I can't make it happen any more than I can make the other person from the first page of Black's, of um, the lived experience of the black man, you know, be my friend rather than my suffocating reifier, right? Um, uh, 
I hope for a certain kind of recognition from the other person, and I offer a certain kind of recognition to that other person. And because we both do it, we're both able to walk up and down that street without ever noticing anything. And indeed, without, with, without recognizing that anything intersubjective is even happening. You, and if most people described it, they would say, well, I didn't even notice that person. I just moved my legs up and down the road. Like you wouldn't, no, very few people describing that action would say, what happened here was a, a complex negotiation of interpersonal recognition. Um, now, we didn't have to do a lot to work it out, but that's because we spent a lot of time growing up and learning how to function in this culture. Going back to my first remark, you know, we, we were inserted in a social system and we learned how to do that in a nasty caste environment in rural India, you might see the same situation where one person flees from the other person walking down the street or it's, in other words treated very badly, where the, the, the uh, anger and violence that one person might direct to another is similarly a playing out of the structures of, of interpersonal recognition that are that are um, uh, built into that social system right so it, whether it's in that situation in India or this situation in Toronto uh, people in their actions are playing out the the values that they have um, internalized for how how they think this social system works and how they fit in it. And uh, in this case, in Toronto, I and the other person I walk past are uh, deeply entrenched in a, in a society that believes in the equal recognition of people and so on. And so we each affirm and respect each other's equal rights to walk up and down that street, right? Let's carry that on, right? When I walk through the door, like, uh, I also know that I can go in there because the store is open and because I'm allowed to. I wouldn't imagine that I could just go in there and fall asleep on the floor or that I could, um, uh, whatever, that's a good enough example, because it's not my place. It's somebody else's place. And the, the whole way I relate to that coffee shop is, is it implies my having internalized all kinds of views about private property and the laws surrounding ownership and so on. And in every little action, I'm reflecting those things. And the action works so smoothly, and I don't have to think about them, because everybody else around me does that too. Let's carry on a little bit farther. When I get to the counter, I treat that human being behind the counter as a server. And that person treats me as a client. Right? I don't... Um, I wouldn't walk up... If we go back to the person who crossed past me on the street, I wouldn't say to that person, Oh, hey, can you get me an Americano? If I did, the person would think I was crazy and would at least be somewhat insulted to, to imagine that I could treat them that way. But I can walk up that same person. If that person works in the coffee shop, I can walk up to that person and say, can you get me an Americano? And they will do it, right? Um, so notice that uh, I deal with a role. In each case, I deal with a role. Yes, I'm dealing with a person. But I'm dealing with a person already highly interpreted according to expectations for how that person can behave, how that person can be behaved at, right? And those situations work because the other person in each case uh, shares that view. So the other person walking down the street and I both recognize their equal rights, that goes smoothly. I recognize the person in the restaurant has to serve me and that person recognizes that he or she or they has to serve me. Uh, and so, so those things work out well. So what I want you to notice here then is that we're just taking that same story about the, the consciousness of man in action as a pre-reflective consciousness, dot, 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 exigency, instrumentality, you know, that thing uh, from page 74. Um, uh, that analysis is exactly the same, but what we need to see here is that that dialectic of body and world that we were talking about is... Um, the very meaning of that is defined by these relations of intersubjectivity, of subjects encountering each other and each other's interpret interpretations of each other. Um, and that's what we're navigating. You're not just navigating your shoelaces and you're tying your shoe. You're also navigating what that means about, you know, how I interact with other people. Um, you're not just navigate with, with, with your hand. You're picking up a coffee cup. 
but that very action is also a gesture. It's also a way of saying something about how you interpret yourself in this human situation and how you interpret the others in this human situation. And every action you engage in ever is like that. Right? And, you know, I hope that my example of walking down the street was a sufficiently neutral example to see that even in these things that might look like a thing you're just doing by yourself, uh, you're already deeply steeped in intersubjective interpersonal social meaning. You know, I mean, go back to the to the house. Like, yeah, you were sitting by yourself in the house when you were reading that book, but just at the simplest level, you private property and ownership were there and the fact that you call it my apartment, you know, and that you think you can keep other people out and you own those books and so on. Um, we could probably add more and more uh, things. I don't want to take the time to investigate that. I hope that I can just simply make the point that in all of our actions, here's the point, in all of our actions, our ability to carry out that smooth, pre-reflective answering to the instrumentalities uh, dictated by a structure of exigency, our ability to do that is never in our hands alone. Our ability to do that is mediated by or dependent upon the support of the others. The only reason I can so easily open that door in the coffee shop is because the relevant other people agree that that's an appropriate thing for me to do. And, you know, watch a crazy person come into a coffee shop and you'll see how quickly uh, uh, certain actions are not liked and not tolerated, right? Um, uh, I can go to the counter and buy a cup of coffee without ever thinking about it because the relevant other person or the relevant other people, and there are lots of people, there's the owners, there's the person behind the counter, but there's also all the people in the coffee shop, there are all the people on the street, like everybody has to collectively share a vision about this, basically the system about how people are going to relate to each other. That has to be in place for me to be able to do this thing smoothly and easily. Um, so, so yes, when we talked about the body scheme or we talked about my smooth, easy, pre-reflective functioning, that can happen only, always can happen only because other people are letting it happen. And that means, um, my actions work smoothly in a context where my set of interpretive expectations about myself and myself in relationship to other people, my interpretations of other people, are compatible with the interpretations those other people have of themselves and me and so on. And therefore, and when that happens, in all of our actions, we are affirming and reaffirming that social system of interpretation. Right? So what happens in the case of Fanon is his actions don't go so smoothly. Right? So what, what, he, what he's saying here is for the he ex he experienced himself as someone who suddenly could never act smoothly because in basically in every dimension of his, of the action in his life um the thing that was coming from him was confronted by something coming from the other where those two interpretations did not mesh and the the human world in which he was living in the way it interpreted him where that interpretation was expressed through behavior did not interpret him in a way that allowed him to be a smooth functioning agent um, and that's what he means when he says in the white world the man of color encounters difficulties in elaborating his body schema let me just let me let me stop that point there. I hope that's clear enough. I mean, what I really wanted to get, um, I wanted to use the my last point really just to bring out these ideas from phenomenology, but I wanted now to be talking about the specific things he's putting forward. And so that's that's the first one I think that, that that's the powerful idea that the that this essay really hinges on, uh, and it's it is this idea of the problem of uh, racial oppression. Um, showing up at the level of the body schema, which is to say you can't act if you're black in this society uh, because the very capacity to be an actor in the way that we've investigated at, the, at a level below thinking, right, at the very level of inhabiting your body, the very level of having a meaningful relationship between your body and the world, 
that relationship is always intersubjectively mediating. And in this world, uh, that intersubjective structure is fundamentally crippling and, as he says, um, suffocating for the black man. Now, so, so in what he discovered is that he couldn't act. He couldn't just be a subject. Right? Uh, and that was the same point he made on the first page. But now he's making it not at the level of like what it feels like to reflectively think about yourself in the eyes of others. It's at the level of functioning. He's, it's be, the world is speaking to him now, right? In, in, the case on the, in the case of being on the train, it's like the very train seats are now telling him he's a different kind of person because he needs three train seats. Not because his body is so big, but because the way the other people behave, they say, you're the kind of thing that nobody can sit beside. Right? And so he's starting to find that the, 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 the very material world in which he is operating does not interact with his body in that smooth, seamless way uh, that we would normally expect to be the case in action. That, so that's that. Uh, uh, okay, let me and let me. Add that. So so what what he what does he say then? He says that he can no longer than himself just live his body as the I can. His body has become thematized now for him as an object for others, and it's become thematized for him in a way that inhibits his ability to act. Uh, and what he discovers is that in the eyes of the other, in this case, the white, the white man, he acts for them as a Negro, not unlike the way the person in the coffee shop acts for you as a server, right? The, 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 you don't encounter that person as a person in the full rich sense. You don't try to. And fortunately, that person probably doesn't want you to. That person has accepted his or her or their identity as a server, just as you project it on them. And that's why those things work that you you say here's what you are i have these expectations about you and i expect you to conform to them and everything's going to go smoothly and the only reason you can smoothly go through your buying of coffee is because you project that identity on the person right well here fanon finds people are projecting an identity on him but that identity is uh of the negro right and so that means the, the historical racial schema that he talks about basically means that he, uh, just as the server actually acts as a server, he finds himself uh, unwillingly acting as a Negro in the sense that that is what people interpret, whether he intends it or not. And by acting as a Negro, it means acting as someone who they have already defined in a certain way. They have certain expectations about. And in part, it means... Um, being defined as someone who belongs to that race, which in this case means something historical, right? It's a, not just something epidermal, not just, it doesn't just mean you're black. It means you come from that history of, in this case, uh, primitive, cannibalistic, uncivilized people who uh, can't really function very well in civilized society or something like that right that's that something like that is the vision that's put upon him um uh so that's really what he comes to discover that that's kind of what his actions mean to other people quite which is quite different from what he meant his actions to mean and so his attempt to be one kind of person constantly fails because the world he's acting in demands that they be the actions of this other kind of person, right? this other kind of identity that has been invented and put upon him. Um, uh, and the second thing is, he, you know, the coffee shop attendant can be recognized as a coffee shop attendant because that person goes in and stands behind the counter at the coffee shop and wears a little coffee shop hat or whatever it is, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you see that same person walking down the street and it could be anybody. Yeah, it doesn't work quite the same way with him because his skin actually has features that other people identify as evidence that he is that kind of thing. And that, I think, is the the core of the epidermal idea. Um, so he, his body is defined by those epidermal features. And in being thus defined, he is identified 
by this role that is put upon him, this identity that's put upon him that has to do with being, you know, a member of the Negro race with all the historical meaning that, that is uh, imputed or whatever the word would be fixed upon that. Um, uh, there would be lots to explore there, but I really, you know, I really just want to try to introduce this essay that, and I want to just try to make what I think is the core point there. I don't want to bring out so much more of, of that. I, I now want to move on to what I think is the way the essay moves. So that was a description of where he finds himself. And I, I think it's quite a powerful description. Um, as I read what happens in the essay, then he really talks about the series of sort of stages he goes through in dealing with that situation that we've just described right so he you know uh, the, the little girl or little boy little girl whatever it is says look mommy a negro um there you get a situation like he's suddenly defined in this way so like it's something like you know that happens he has this experience and now he's going to go through a series of stages in digesting and interpreting that experience um stages here uh I'm going to do a pretty rough and ready version of, you know, what I kind of do. I wrote something down. Let's see if I have it. Yeah. I tried very quickly to to sketch out what I think are kind of the core moves. Uh, it's not precise. And, uh, you know, somebody else could sit down and do a much better job of mapping this out. Um, so I think what I say is approximate, but I think it will be clear enough. Um, they're also, you know, he's giving you sort of stages. I mean, in a, no doubt these are simultaneously biographical and fictional. Like he's probably telling you something real about his own history of, how his consciousness developed, his own experience of having his consciousness raised, so to speak. Uh, but I think he's also giving a kind of stylized set, like you could have this reaction, and that would lead to this reaction, that would lead to this reaction. So he's doing something, you know, not unlike what you would see in Hegel's Phenomenology or in the second chapter of um, Gebel Ethics of Ambiguity, like, you know, looking at certain sort of types, uh, recognizable types of ways that a person could take up a existential situation and he's he's both sort of showing you the sense of why it would make sense to take this up and also why it fails so there is a in that in that sense there is a kind of dialectical structure to this too that like you would see in de Beauvoir or in Hegel um, I'm not going to try to bring that out in any deep way and, I, and I'm not I'm not sure that it is here in a deep way it might be somebody who's a real expert in this text might might be able to show that this, this is a you know razor sharp at every point but I, but I'm, I'm going to sketch it out as a, as a, you know, sort of approximate set of movements. But I, I think they're clear enough. Um, uh, so very quickly, I think, you know, he's, he's talking about this little kid at least, and but probably also in other situations. It seems like his first, his first move is in a sense to accept it. You know, oh, okay, uh, yeah, I'm objectified, whatever. Um, and uh, so the, it's kind of, I don't know whether that's a stoic attitude or, or what, kind of shrugging off or, or whatever, just a tolerant attitude. Um, but so he says, uh, so uh, the child says, look, a Negro. And he says, oh, it was a passing sting. But I attempted a smile. And he repeats it, look, a Negro. Oh, absolutely. I was beginning to enjoy myself. Da, 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 da. Um, uh, I mean, there it seems like he's, he's, sort of, he's sort of saying, you can try to play along. And accept maybe just because it's from a little kid or something uh anyway that that attitude of acceptance takes on a bigger form too he says you know i was defined by my race and he, he said well um uh, he says at the bottom of 92 well i decided i would accept this and he said you know i considered this internal kinship from the universal level of the intellect i was the grandson of slaves in the same way that president lebrun was the grandson of peasants who had been exploited and so on um so he says you know uh, I'll accept it, and then he sort of says, "Well, maybe it's not unique to me. Like uh, maybe everybody is subject to this kind of thing." Right? So that's that's his first move. Um, but so I think that for me, the interesting thing is then what happens next. Like, why does that turn out not to be satisfactory? And I, I guess there are two things. So why why is he not? So he, first he says, "Well, maybe it's me being like President LeBron," but it's not like him because um, the situation of President LeBron is not matched by the same reality of social oppression uh, that he faces. So in his case, that identification has very, very different consequences. Very, very Not just consequences for him, but like the social reality of the thing he's talking about is very different from the fact that the president can uh, say, you know, I come from poor, poor ancestors and so on. But secondly, I guess it's not, it's not, this isn't secondly, but it's, it's, 
this is just another side of that same thing. So he says on 94, um, the, the the suffocating presence of the white world, I can't remember if that's the quotation, but the next part is he says, he refers to the white world as the only decent one, right? The, uh, the point is that that world, the only decent one, wasn't allowing him to participate. Um, so, uh, so the problem with that notion of acceptance is that at a certain level, it's unacceptable. Like it's not just uh, a passing identification where you can say, "Yeah, that's true," yeah, but here's my great reality. On the contrary, it's it's a it's a it's an identification that is going hand in hand with uh, a refusal to allow him to allow black people to to participate meaningfully in the society, um, and so. Uh, so it's not the kind of thing that can be shrugged off, right? And it's and in that sense, it's not the same as the example of President LeBron. But and I want to underline that sentence: the white world, the only decent one. Because right? I'm, I'm going to come back to that later. Um, let me add another point out here too. Notice that that already there's a move here because the move has already gone from just the personal to something like recognizing that you live in a world, you live in a kind of an environment. Um, a meaningful environment, and that, and that that is going back to the thing we were saying before. That's the arena for your actions that that, that allows or disallows them, and so on. Um, anyway, so that's so it's like a I'm going to accept it. Not a nah, it's not the same, right? Um, so then that that leads to attitude B, which is roughly anger, um, uh, and. This is one that I find particularly interesting. Um, the, I think and this this is related to the um, white world being the only uh, decent one. Um, his anger has no effect. Nobody cares. Right? That he's he's angry that he's mistreated, and people might say, "Oh yes, that's bad," or whatever. But but it has no effect. And so I wanted to think about why that's particularly debilitating. Now, of course, it's crucial. It's always crucial to remember that people can be angry for the wrong reasons. So certainly there are cases where people are angry and they're in the wrong for being angry. But at its root, it seems to me, anger means something different, right? Anger is uh, an expression of being mistreated, right? It, it is, uh, it is um, the announcing that um, one is being subjected to a kind of unfairness and you know I got to speak loudly I got to speak angrily because nobody's listening so it's 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 like an alarm right so in the normal world it should be the case that if something gets to the point where somebody has to express anger that you go oh if you're angry at me then I need to step back and think about what I'm, how I might have done something wrong. Now, as I said, of course, people can can get angry improperly. So I don't, I by any means, want to assert that every time people are angry, they're, you know, they should be taken seriously. Um, but I do want to try to identify that in, in a way as the core of what what anger really means, and that's why you can say someone got angry wrongly, because you. You shouldn't be getting angry unless it is the expression of, of uh, injustice, right? Uh, so there's there's a kind of a meaning inherent to anger. It can be mishandled from the point of view of the one delivering it, but there's a kind of meaning. Well, the relevant point here is it can be mishandled by the one receiving. Nobody takes him seriously. Nobody cares that he's angry. So this expression of anger should be uh, 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 the the... Uh, sound of injustice sort of being heard or what you know it, like it, it it should be um evidence of injustice but that's the problem of the fact that the white world is the only decent world right decent meaning the world that defines itself as the upholder of moral values and the world that, uh, that upholds the moral values doesn't care at all when it is being called out for racial oppression. Now, that's a pretty debilitating thing. And maybe that helps to underline 
that notion I was making before about the sort of debilitating character of at the level of the body scheme of not being able to act right that that you enter into the world sort of interpreting yourself as an agent and the thing that comes back at you doesn't doesn't fit well here you're seeing that same kind of thing like don't you live in a world where morality makes sense and where profound and obvious injustice should matter well it turns out you don't you live in a world his experience is this i live in the world basically of a European culture, white European culture, the world of European colonialism that uh, we were talking about before. I live in this world which defines itself as the world of moral value. And that world uh, has no interest in recognizing its own moral failings. Right? So that's the, the, the interesting and troubling thing that uh, comes up with anger Anger as a response makes sense, but also anger as a response doesn't work. So he has acceptance and he has anger. And if in different ways, they both don't work. Um, that doesn't mean his anger is just going to go away, but it means that he can't that he can't stop there. So what happens next? So the next thing is so so those ones those ones were both those two attitudes as, as I see them, as I said, this is a quick, a pretty rough and ready sketch that like, uh, but I think it matches the things he's saying. And both, both of those are kind of premised on the idea that we're all in this together. Right. So the acceptance is kind of, is kind of a thing that happens among equals. The anger even is something that happens among equals and they both fail. It's kind of like that announces this is you're not in this world. This is them against us. Um, and, so here then he the third stage is really to in a in a i guess to identify himself with that thing he's been identified as being namely a black man he identifies with his blackness but ideally in a way different from the way that it's being projected upon him uh it seems to me this this also goes through roughly a few stages and and uh, uh, I don't know, as I said, I don't know that I can pull this off completely systematically, but roughly uh, it goes, you know, from from uh, turning to reason and, and seeking uh, a kind of um, higher ground of human unity to turning next to that. I'm not going to, you, you can read it like it's pretty clear for various reasons. That's uh, uh, insufficient. He turns then to to the theme of the irrational, right? From reason to non-reason. This is the one that's kind of interesting. Like it turns out, well, you know, uh, maybe that black history you're you're um, identified with is actually a good thing. Uh, you're you you know, we called you primitive, but maybe it's good to be primitive because maybe that means you're in touch with the roots of human meaning in a way that uh, highly refined European society has lost, and so on. Um, so, you know, he, he has a kind of ambivalent relationship that like he says, yeah, I can, there's something, something, you know, I saw something kind of appealing about that, but it also, um, there's also something kind of, um, insulting and dismissive about it and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So both of those don't work, right? Just going for, uh, identifying this blackness and then trying to solve some problems through a certain kind of reason doesn't work. Identifying these problems and trying to solve something through a kind of celebration of irrationality doesn't work. Um, the last one is uh, essentially looking at history and, and thinking, well, maybe there is a reality to the world I come from that uh, is, I guess, the uh, historical origins of uh, the nations and so on that he might that he and his people might have belonged to, but also the the those with whom he is identified by the white European views that are projected upon him. It's a matter of investigating those things, those things that are the other to the, to the white world and seeing what those things really have been. And, and, see, uh, and this goes through some stages too, but maybe here's the, the sort of important and interesting point. Like could, could it be the case that there is, something meaningfully meaningful and worthwhile in black history that um, uh, in its own right um, it doesn't have to be better than the things that you would find in the white world 
doesn't even really have to compete with them. But maybe there's there's just an, there are just there's interesting cultural history here, uh, and maybe maybe indeed one could use this history as a way to educate oneself into being a human being and use its resources to deal with human problems, just as in other places people use European history to do that. I guess, so I guess, I guess uh, that, that last one, that especially comes up, I think, around page 109. Let me just have a look. Yeah, he says, uh, it was here that I made my, first, my most remarkable discovery, which in actual fact was a rediscovery in a frenzy I excavated black antiquity. Um, so basically, the, the the third step right after after the acceptance and anger, the third step was to see if blackness in its own right could be something of worth. You know, there are various ways he moves through that, all of which are worth investigating and, and so on. And I'm, that's not the th particular thing I'm after here. But I'm interested in this last, this, just this last point. That well, l actually, let me interrupt that sentence and come back to something else I said and then return to that sentence. So before he talked about the white world as the only decent world, and he has another remark like that too. On 95, he talks, that was on 94. On 95, he talks about the white gaze as the only valid gaze. So he's saying the world to which he has been subjected, the, wor the, the world of basically white European colonization and so on, uh, uh, that world defines itself as the only decent one. In other words, it defines itself as the one that possesses the the rights, or you know, the it gets to say that it's it's morally good, and it gets to say what is morally good. Similarly, it's the only val the white gaze is the only valid one, right? So, from, both from the point of view of morality and from point of view of knowledge, the white world essentially claims ownership. Here, around page one hundred nine, I don't know if I can find the sentence that quickly. No, I can't. I can't find it that quickly, but but here he's saying also, you know, the white world also has tied up history. Like it gets to tell the complete story. Like yeah, we 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 came to the truth of moral value, and we came to the truth of knowledge, and so forth. Therefore, our history is the whole history of how you got there. Uh, so there's a history in which the meaning of any other civilization has been written out. Um, and so, um, uh so the, I guess it's that, so. There's a notion of completeness that the white world associates with itself. So one of the things that's interesting here is the the investigation of black culture and so on, in a way that is is not premised on accepting that the 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 world of uh, white globalized European culture is the one and only culture. It's not accepting that it's complete and not accepting its claims, and being open to the idea that there might be an alternative. And this is kind of the reason that he complains about a sentence he finds in Sartre. Um, I mean, I don't find the things he says there about Sartre that compelling myself, but but the, but I think his point is clear enough, whether or not it applies. You know, Sartre says that um, the kind of blackness movement uh, uh, can't ultimately be the last. He, he seems to say certainly that it can't ultimately be the last word because um, the the uh, celebration of blackness in, in opposition to the white world or something like that could only ever be a strategic step towards something that is not um, limited to celebrating a particular group or something in the long run. So so Sartre in a way seems to speak. Uh, from the point of view of already knowing the answer of, what, of where you're going to get to. And that's that's the thing that, that uh, Fanon complains about. And as I say, whether or not that really fits Sartre, the point I think is a good one, that the, the idea here is to think about the richness and the meaningfulness of whatever black culture and black history might mean without having foreclosed in advance, right? The idea that there could be something to be found there. Uh, so looking to another world or another tradition, trying to learn from it about how to think of and deal with the world without without know, without deciding that you know that you're not going to find anything new. And that equally means then without sort of in your pack pocket thinking, yeah, I already know the answers because we got them already from the white culture. Uh, let, let me basically leave it there. That Something like that, I think, is roughly the set of steps that he goes through. Um, and so it's a it's a 
it's quite a change to go from feeling personally uncomfortable because a little girl said something to you to seeing yourself as um, deeply committed to a cultural project to re-engage black culture for the purpose of transforming the, the character of world culture and world history. It's kind of the ground that's covered in a handful of steps. Um, and at the way, the way there is, you know, through a series of attitudes that make sense, but he's also sort of saying, yeah, you could have this attitude, but here are the problems that come up. Um, so I think that that, that as a set of steps is pretty worth investigating and thinking about. Um, so let me pause it there and then I'll come back and, and make my last point.